All right, perfect. And with that done, I'm going to pass it over to Christina to introduce our speaker for tonight. Thanks, Nick. All right, so I have the absolute privilege of introducing our speaker for today, um, Dr. Julius Oates. Dr. Oates is a pediatric ophthalmologist and childhood glaucoma specialist. He is an assistant professor and associate residency program director at UCSF. Um, so Dr. Oates, thank you so much for joining us tonight. Cool, thanks so much for having me. And I apologize to anyone that tried to come to the originally scheduled session. I had uh, what does not happen very frequently for me actually, but uh, emergency add-on surgery that was supposed to end in time for me to join, but unfortunately did not. So I apologize for the scheduling challenges, but appreciate that all of you made it here today. And I'm excited to talk to you a little bit about ophthalmology. So the Hopkins group kind of gave me the charge to talk a little bit about how I find my way to ophthalmology, a day in the life, go through some interesting cases and talk about different aspects of my job. So that's what I'll be doing today. So uh, my journey to ophthalmology, um, I was home recently. So I grew up in Colorado and I was home um, visiting my parents and I was just looking through some things in my old room and I found this. So this is a uh, picture of me when I was a little kid. And I don't know if you all ever had to do this in elementary school, but you had to make like little books. I took the liberty of, you know, writing myself a little bio in the third person. And so here, this is from, I don't know, I was maybe like eight or nine and it says, um, this book was written by a friendly young author <laughs> named J.T. Oates. That's what my parents called me. He loves to run and hang out with his friends. He loves to write and wants to be a doctor when he grows up. Um, so I made it, mom and dad. I'm a doctor. But um, I included this because I think that as a kid, um, even as a you know college student, you don't really know what it means to be a doctor. And um, so I'm hoping to tell you a little bit more about what it's actually like. And I would say that I'm, I'm pretty happy that I made the choice that I made. If I could go back, I would change that to say he wants to be a pediatric ophthalmologist when he grows up. So a day in the life of me as a pediatric ophthalmologist, this is a picture of me with a few of my patients. Um, that kind of embodies one thing that I really love about pediatric ophthalmology, which is that you're not just taking care of a patient, you're really taking care of a family unit. So this was a young child that was born premature. She had some um, congenital brain abnormalities and due to that had some vision issues. So you can see her mom and loving sister who's looking on with curiosity, were able to come with her to the appointment and really are the ones that will advocate for her treatments that will provide the best possible vision for her for the rest of her life, which leads me to another part of my job that I really like, which is the uh, potential to make a big impact on someone's life uh, for a long period of time. So as you all might know, ophthalmology generally deals with conditions that are age-related. So the most common things being like cataract, macular degener degeneration, glaucoma, pediatric ophthalmology. On the other hand, you're seeing kids that have issues in their first often few years of life or even few days of life. And the treatments that we're able to provide for them can actually account for a lifetime of improved vision that they would not have had if they didn't meet you. In terms of what my day-to-day -day life looks like, I um, wear a few different hats and I'll talk about them a little bit later in the course, but from a clinical perspective, I see patients uh, two days a week. So I see about 12 to 20 patients in a half day. So they get to be pretty busy clinics. Um, and then I spend about one day a week in the operating room where I do five to eight surgical cases. And the rest of my time during the week, I have some administrative responsibilities. So I help lead the residency program here at UCSF. Um, I do some research projects, which I'll talk to you a little bit more about. And then I teach and mentor. So it's a nice kind of well-rounded um, experience. So I'm going to go through just a few cases to give you examples of some kids that I've seen in my clinic um, with kind of a broad range of pathologies. So the first was a two-month-old baby that was referred to my clinic for an abnormal red reflex. So for those of you that have done your clinical rotations, you probably know, or your pediatric rotation specifically, probably know how to check a red reflex. So you can use a few different instruments in ophthalmology, use what's called a retinoscope. You might be using a direct ophthalmoscope, and that's essentially making sure that there's a clear view into the back of the infant's eye, which designates the fact that they can see clearly also. So there's nothing blocking their view. Um, so when a pediatrician is not able to elicit a red reflex during a child's well-child examination, they're referred to a pediatric ophthalmologist. And for young children, it's usually a pretty um, urgent referral because if the child has some type of opacity, it needs to be acted on sooner rather than later so that their brain is able to use the eye and start learning to see. 
So just a little bit more of this patient's history. So she was born full term, um, normal weight, had normal APGARs, but was small for gestational age while they were developing. Um, no known ocular history, um, did have bilateral hearing loss. So the baby had failed their hearing test in addition to the red reflex test, was not on any medications, didn't have any allergies, and there was no um, family history of childhood eye disease. The father had keratoconus, which is often an acquired condition, and then the parents were um, related. So this is a representative picture we took actually from the operating room, but this is how the child looked when they presented to the clinic. So um, you don't have to be an ophthalmologist or a pediatric ophthalmologist probably to know that this is not what the inside of an eye should look like. So here we're looking at the um, cornea, which is the clear part in the front of the eye, the pupil, which is the opening in the iris. And you can see that the pupil is completely occluded by what looks kind of like a white fluffy material. And that's a cataract, it's a congenital cataract. Um, the patient had the same finding in both eyes. So one thing that was really important to do when you see a baby with a cataract and you can't see into the back of the eye is to try to image the back of the eye. Because sometimes things like a tumor in the back of the eye can cause a cataract because maybe the tumor is pushing on the lens and it causes the lens to become a cataract. So we did an ultrasound of the eye, and this is a quite normal ultrasound. So you can see this nice kind of round globe. The cornea, which is the front of the eye, would be over on the left. The retina is along the kind of back wall of the eye. And then this kind of interesting little um, hyper-reflective band that's kind of going along the top of the globe is an extraocular muscle. Not really important for our diagnosis, but just kind of interesting. So we had a diagnosis here of bilateral congenital cataracts in a two-month-old. So like I was mentioning before, when you see a child with cataracts, it's a little bit different than when you see an adult. You see an adult with cataracts, you can have a conversation with them, ask them if they're having trouble driving or maybe having trouble seeing at night, and they can decide really if they want to have cataract surgery that year, in five years, in 10 years, never have surgery. For children with cataracts, uh, the choice isn't quite the same because basically if you, the parents say, oh, let's wait until my kid's older to take the cataracts out and you do cataract surgery when the kid is 12 or so. By that point, the period of neuroplasticity, or when the brain is kind of learning how to use the eyes, has ended. So even if you did perfect cataract surgery, everything looked great, the child's vision wouldn't improve because the brain had never had the opportunity to learn what clear vision was like through the eyes. So in this situation, the diagnosis of cataracts led to surgery. So I wanted to show you uh, the surgical video that I did for this patient. So here we're using a small blade. That blade is about one millimeter in width to make incisions in the eye. These funny little black things are called iris hooks. They open up the pupil if the pupil doesn't dilate well. Now we have a needle inside the eye. We've stained the lens with a blue dye to help visualize it better. The needle was helping to create an opening in the capsule, which is kind of like a bag that holds the lens. Right now you can see the lens is all gone. The capsule has this little plaque on it which is common in congenital cataracts. So we're kind of opening that capsule to make a clear opening. And so, and then there's a medication that's injected into the eye. That's what you're seeing there, a kind of opaque steroid medication to help with post-operative inflammation. So I don't know if y'all have seen adult cataract surgery, but this is a little bit different. We use slightly different instruments and that's just because of um, a few factors like the size of the eye and the elasticity of the eye in young children. Okay, so next we're going to move on to a slightly different case, which is actually a child that had lots of systemic conditions that happened to manifest in the eyes. So this was a nine-year-old boy who was um, in the hospital, and we were consulted urgently for progressive perperic right facial swelling. He has kind of a complex medical history and has this rare congenital disorder, which is called a congenital disorder of glycosylation type 1A. This condition presents with developmental delay, seizures, and can affect lots of different organ systems. So it can have hematologic implications, liver dysfunction, kidney problems. Um, he had been followed actually in the eye clinic before for a few conditions, including being nearsighted and having some retinal pigmentary changes, which are associated with this condition, as well as esotropia or eye crossing. So a little bit more about the history. So one day prior to his presentation to the hospital, he had a fever and some abdominal pain and vomiting. And so his parents brought him to the emergency room. At that point, he was diagnosed with uh, left lower lobe pneumonia, bilateral pleural effusions, and started on broad spectrum antibiotics. So this kid uh, basically was quite sick from a pneumonia and then all of a sudden developed this facial 
rash and swelling. So you can see these pictures here on the left is from 6 a.m. and then the right is 10 a.m. So just over the period of four hours, you can see this kind of what used to be kind of like a faint flat purplish rash has really now taken over most of his face. So we weren't able to check his vision. Actually, I think by the time I saw him, he was intubated because of um, this swelling was also affecting his airway. Um, on his pupillary examination, he had what's called an afferent pupillary defect on the right, which is basically a way to say that the optic nerve on the right is not sending the same information as the optic nerve on the left. So something has happened to the right eye that has damaged the optic nerve. And then his eye pressure, intraocular pressure on the right eye was 83. So normal eye pressure is 21 or less. Um, so 83 is quite abnormal. And then the left eye was normal. So this is what he looked like when I saw him. You can see there's a little line where they were monitoring um, the progression of this rash. And essentially what had happened for this child is he had what's called orbital compartment syndrome. So you all might've heard of compartment syndrome maybe on your orthopedics rotation where essentially you have bleeding or extravasation of fluid in a contained space. The orbit um, is actually a contained space as well. So what happens when there's lots of swelling or bleeding around the orbit is that it can push the eye forward, which stretches the optic nerve and can cause optic nerve damage. So he had an MRI, which showed exactly that. So proptosis of the right globe, meaning that the right globe was being pushed forward um, and re reduced diffusivity along the optic nerve, which basically means that probably there was some damage to the optic nerve from this um, period of stress. And then they said correlate um, clinically, which radiologists usually do. So I don't have a video of what we did for this specific patient, but I'll show you a representative video I found, which is called a canthotomy cantholysis, which is essentially a procedure that is designed to relieve pressure in the orbit or open up um, pressure. So essentially, see if I can get this video to play. So this is from um, a doctor in Colorado. So again, I did not make this video, but wanted to show you. Yeah. You good, Mike? Yep. Let me just, um, I guess the sound is going to play. So basically you make a cut at the lateral um, campus, which is basically where the upper and the lower eye would join. You're basically opening up the space. Good. To the, and now go to cantholysis. Um, you can see the effect of the local. Extra pressure to go. There's a little tendon called the inferior campal tendon, which helps keep the lower eyelid in place. And that has to be cut as well to really free the lower eyelid kind of open the space um, so that that pressure is not being exerted on the optic nerve. You all get the sense there. Um, so he, um, the ultimate kind of conclusion from this is that this patient developed a kind of reactive um, hyper, um, actually hypocoagulable, so bleeding state um, due to his underlying condition to this infection. Um, fortunately for him, his vision was actually not affected and that might've been multifactorial. One is that we're able to perform this procedure quite quickly after his uh, swelling developed and the pressure in the eye normalized quite quickly. And then also he did have some baseline kind of visual impairment um, from his retinal changes secondary to his system conditions, so um, didn't have perfect vision to begin with, but ultimately was a way that we were able to help save vision for this patient that had an ophthalmic manifestation of a systemic condition. Okay, so this is the last of the three clinical cases I'll share with you. So this was a 19-month-old baby or child that was referred for what the parents had noticed of um, bilateral ptosis, which is drooping of the upper eyelids, and intermittent exotropia, so meaning that the eyes were drifting outwards. So on her review system, she was otherwise well, so there weren't any concerns about, you know, neurologic symptoms, um, headaches, anything like that, eye pain. Um, in terms of her past medical history, she was born full term via C-section. She was healthy, didn't spend any time in the hospital, and then um, doesn't have a really remarkable ocular history in the family. So this is what she looks like when she presented. So you can see exactly what the parents are describing, right? So you see the ptosis, which is the droopiness of the upper eyelids. Um, and then you could probably imagine it's a little bit hard because of the ptosis, but you can see that the eyes aren't quite pointing the same direction. So that's called exotropia when one eye is pointing um, out. So given that this is a little bit of an unusual presentation, most children that present with just a straightforward ptosis or a straightforward um, exotropia, not with both in conjunction. So I wanted to make sure there wasn't anything unusual going on in the brain. And unfortunately, her MRI of the brain was quite normal. Um, given, again, that it was quite an unusual scenario in terms of the pattern of the eye misalignment, did a little bit of a further investigation 
and found that the patient had elevated acetylcholine receptor binding antibodies. So this is a condition that you might think of in adults, so less commonly in children, but myasthenia gravis is a condition that can manifest very rarely in children and typically presents with a variable strabismus. So it can be exotropia like this patient had or an esotropia with the eyes crossing inwards. It could be a vertical strabismus where one eye is higher than the other and often is variable and kind of varies throughout the day. So similar to the symptoms that you see in adults. So given this, the patient was recommended to have an, MR, an MRI of the chest to make sure there was no thymoma, which the patient didn't have. And then she's also started on mestinon dosing, which helped a little bit with her symptoms, um, but her symptoms were persisting. So in coordination with her um, endocrinologist, the decision was made to start her on steroids. And uh, miraculously, uh, once we treated the underlying condition, her eye misalignment and ptosis both resolved. So this is a great um, example of something that can be quite common in children, which is eye misalignment or strabismus, having an uncommon cause, which is myasthenia, and the importance of really kind of thinking through the differential diagnosis before you jump into treatment. I didn't have I didn't have a case to present to you of just a straightforward strabismus, but I will say that that's one of the most common conditions that we see as pediatric ophthalmologists, and I wanted to show you something that we can do for strabismus. So not in a patient like this who has an underlying cause of their strabismus, but in a patient that has um, a strabismus that is isolated and not associated with any neurologic or systemic condition, we can do strabismus surgery, which is basically a mechanical positioning of the eyes to straighten the eyes, align the eyes. So I'll just show you this video of a medial rectus resection. So the medial rectus is one of six muscles that control the eye. It's medial, so meaning by the nose. And what we do to access the muscles, we make an incision on the surface of the eye, which is the conjunctiva. Now we're dissecting between the conjunctiva and the sclera. This tool is called a muscle hook. And that's exactly what it does. It hooks muscles. So the medial rectus is the muscle um, where right in front of the hook, right under the conjunctiva. So you can't quite see the muscle yet because we have this layer of conjunctiva covering it. But once we confirm that our hooks are in the right place, we put the perfect type of hook under there. There's a few different types. Um, we will start to reflect the conjunctiva over the muscle to expose the muscle. So that's what's happening here reflect the conjunctiva over the muscle. And then the muscles are covered in kind of a sheath, uh, which is called an intermuscular septum. So you have to cut that on the other side of the muscle to really isolate the muscle. The pull test is a way that we make sure that we didn't split the muscle, meaning that we have the entire muscle on our hook. And now we're doing some just tissue dissection around the muscle to isolate the muscle before we move on to the next step. Now you can kind of see what looks like a muscle, right? So you see that kind of pinkish thing that you see, that little white that's on the front of it is some of the intermuscular septum that is there. So now we're measuring a section of the muscle that we're going to cut out. So you can imagine that if we cut out a part of the muscle, it's going to help pull the eye in that direction. So this is the medial rectus muscle. If we cut out a part of the medial rectus, it will put the eye closer medially. So this is a patient that had an exotropia, just like the case I showed you. Um, and we're doing eye muscle surgery again to try to straighten the eyes, bring the eye closer to center. So we're placing a suture in the middle of the muscle, tying it here with some needle drivers. This is a 6-0 suture. So for those of you that have done surgical rotations, the higher the number, the finer the suture. So in abdominal surgery, you're probably using maybe like three O's or four O's. So this is a six O. In ophthalmology, we go all the way to 10 O's. So if we're suturing the cornea, we'll use a 10 O suture, which is uh, quite fine. So now we're just doing um, a few maneuvers here to what's called imbricate the muscle, basically meaning securing it on the suture. So now, like I mentioned, we're going to cut part of the muscle out. So we want to clamp the muscle first to achieve hemostasis, and then we're using scissors to cut the front part of the muscle. So now the muscle is cut in half. Half of it is still attached to the eye then half of it is attached to the sutures. The part that's bleeding is the part that's attached to the eye. So now we're going to cut that part off. So that's called the muscle stump or the part of the muscle that we're going to be removing. 
And sometimes it's useful to have little forceps on the surface of the eye to kind of mark the position of the prior muscle insertion so that we can suture it back there in the same spot. But now the muscle is going to pull the eye inwards a little bit stronger because the muscle is shorter. Now we want to make sure there's no bleeding over the sclera before we start to suture the muscle back to the eye. So we're using the needles that are attached to the muscle, making scleral passes, so suturing through the sclera, making sure obviously not to go full thickness because you might find something like the retina there, which is not what you want to suture during strabismus surgery. Passing the two poles or the two halves of the suture, You pull the new muscle all the way up. So basically back to right at where it was, but now missing probably five millimeters or so, so that it's stronger. And then suture it to the eye. Confirm that it's in the right position before you tie the knot. A few nice things about strabismus surgery and eye surgery in general is that you get to sit down when you operate. That's always nice. Um, you also get to use either a microscope or fine microsurgical instruments. Um, so those are things that I enjoy. And then, um, this is just a, so this is an ADO suture now that we're using to close the conjunctiva. And these are absorbable sutures, both the one that sutured the muscle and the one that's suturing the conjunctiva. They last about four to six weeks. So basically you're counting on the body to kind of start forming scar tissue to keep the muscle in place and to keep the conjunctival incision closed. So that is pretty straightforward strabismus surgery. So now we're going to move on to a few different aspects of my job. So um, like Christina mentioned, I do have a leadership position in our ophthalmology residency here at UCSF. So that means uh, I get to hang out with our residents. So these are some of the, uh, we always ask them to take a goofy picture. So, you know, there's some years are goofier than others, but these are some pictures of our current residents. And it's really a joy to get to work with the next generation of ophthalmologists. Um, some of my responsibilities as associate residency program director includes doing end of year and mid-year evaluations with residents, so kind of reviewing comments that they get about their clinical performance, their surgical performance from different faculty. I work with them to implement changes to the resident curriculum, so if they have specific attendings that they really enjoy working with from a learning perspective or specific surgeries that they like doing, we're able to make small changes to their um, rotation schedule to accommodate those. And uh, once a year, we go on what's called a resident retreat, which is where uh, we go somewhere fun, uh, usually around the Bay Area, so wine country, or Mendocino to the beach, um, and then, you know, talk shop for about six hours and then just enjoy the rest of the weekend together. Um, during that time, we will review their curriculum, incorporate any changes they have, review their rotations, review their surgical numbers, um, and get general feedback from them. So that's a really kind of fulfilling and exciting part of my job. Another example of something that we'll do is um, kind of quality improvement projects. So we'll look at, for example, how many cataracts residents are getting in their PGY4 year and their third year of ophthalmology residency and, you know, kind of follow it over time and see if there's any specific trends, if there's anything that's concerning. Um, also, if we're kind of planning to, you know, change the size of the residency, that's something that's helpful um, to look at that way as well. And then the other thing we do is review their rotation. So we have a big grid. Uh, we'll put it up on the screen and basically go like half day by half day for each of the rotations of the residency and ask about the learning experience, ask about any room for improvement, if there's different attendings in that specialty that might be more beneficial for the residents to work with. And then one other thing that I get to do in my role is... Um, We'll Zoom with a lot of people, but this is a specific uh, important Zoom to me, which is the Rab Venable um, Fireside Chat. So the Rab Venable is a great program um, for those underrepresented in medicine that are interested in ophthalmology, and they have a series of kind of um, mentorship talks, career advice, application help, So, and they invite programs to come speak to their um participants to tell them a little bit more about their ophthalmology residency program. So this was a meeting that I was, that I was able to attend to talk about um, my residency program. And then I gave another session at one point discussing, you know, like the SF match application. So this is a great resource for underrepresented medicine candidates uh, interested in ophthalmology. So check it out if you're interested. It's called the Rob um, Venable program. Um, another kind of passion of mine that I'm able to incorporate into my work is diversity, equity, and inclusion. 
So thinking about the ways in which we promote historically minoritized or historically excluded um, people to come to medicine, come to ophthalmology, for me specifically to come to pediatric ophthalmology, <laughs> to come to academic ophthalmology. So I um, am able to do that through uh, not only my residency leadership role, but also through my role on the Departmental um, Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Executive Committee. So we're able to think about specific programs like pipeline programs. How are the ways in which we can encourage underrepresented in medicine folks to consider medicine or to consider ophthalmology? We do education sessions like this one where I was able to kind of talk to my department about Black History Month, um, you know, the history of racism or anti-Black racism in ophthalmology specifically, and how these issues are relevant not only for us, but for our patients, for our trainees. Um, so that's been a kind of personal passion of mine that I've been able to integrate professionally also. Um, another hat that I wear in my day-to-day -day is research, um, but I wanted to start by saying that there can be overlap between research and advocacy or diversity, equity, and inclusion. So this was kind of an interesting project that I worked on, which was looking at the relationship between prison labor and children's eyeglasses. So if I say those two things to you, you might not think that there's a connection, but basically what I found out from one of my patients, so seeing a child, their parents were like, wow, our glasses took a really long time to come. I think they were waiting about three months for our glasses. So I went and talked to our optician. I said, hey, you know, where are these glasses coming from? And he's like, oh, you know, actually these glasses are coming from a prison. And there was a COVID outbreak in the prison. So they stopped the prison labor. So no one has gotten glasses for the past few months because they've stopped the labor operations in this prison. So it led me and a few colleagues to look into this further. And what we found was actually quite um, a complicated relationship where these are actually patients that are on Medi-Cal, which is basically the state funded public insurance, so funded by taxpayers. And Medi-Cal essentially had an exclusive contract with prison optical shops, meaning that any patient that was insured with public insurance had to get their glasses made through prison labor. You can imagine that the uh, financial reason for this was that prison labor is cheaper than non-prison labor. Um, so that was their argument. So we were able to kind of publish this and um, bring light to a kind of unique and interesting interplay between um, the patients that we see, the care that we provide, but also how it uplifts um, oppressive systems um, or systems that disproportionately affect um, minorities or historically minoritized populations. Um, I do non-advocacy <laughs> research also, and I have the opportunity to mentor a few really stellar medical students. Um, so this is one of my medical students, and I had the pleasure of helping advise her on her first first author publication, which was looking at a small volume eye drop adapter and seeing how it compared to normal eye drops in children. The picture on the left is showing you the little blue cap. It's called a nano dropper, and it basically decreases the size of an eye drop. Um, this is useful for a few reasons. First, a lot of pa patients that are on eye drops chronically run out of eye drops by the end of the month, either because you know they squeeze too hard and they they miss, or a few more drops come out, and insurance companies can be quite strict about that. Um, so, from that perspective, decreasing the size of the drop is a great idea as long as we can pr prove that the drops are still effective when they're smaller. And then the other half of that is that oftentimes in children, because their body area is smaller. They're at higher risk for systemic complications from eye drops. So you might not expect that an eye drop could cause a child to, for example, have a seizure or go into cardiac arrest. But these things have actually been reported and happen. And again, it's related to the size of the drop, the size of the child. And once the drop goes through the um, nasal lacrimal system into the nose, there's actually a quite high absorptivity through the nasal mucosa. So that's kind of what inspired this project. And Karis, this excellent medical student here, was able to present at a national meeting and get her paper published. Um, and then just last month, I had another mentee of mine who gave a podium presentation, um, which was really quite impressive. And he did an excellent job. I had a few people say, wow, your resident was great. And I was like, he was a medical student. He did excellent. So he was able to present this really interesting project looking at a new virtual reality visual field test for children. So instead of a kind of traditional visual field test where you have to put your chin in a chin rest and kind of stare ahead at a dome for five to 10 minutes, um, kids are able to wear a virtual reality headset and kind of look around and sit back and relax. It's gamified a little bit. Um, and so he was able to present the results of our pilot study comparing this novel virtual reality technology to standard perimetry testing.
Another project that I have is based in Nepal, actually. So I do some international work. Um, this is a picture of Bharatpur Eye Hospital in Nepal, which is about four hours west of Bangkok driving or about 30 minutes flying. And um, they are a very generous uh, <laughs> population, which is why they gave me a scarf and a uh, trophy for a talk that I gave there. But essentially we are looking at uh, community screening for preventable eye disease. So my mentor does preventable eye disease in adults and I'm looking to expand that to children. So this is just a picture of me with a few of the ophthalmic assistants. You can see we're trying out the virtual reality headset in this older Nepalese woman who has probably never, um, seen a computer so that it's an interesting kind of challenge integrating these newer technologies in that setting. And then on the left here is a new kind of childhood vision screening device that we are piloting. So that comes to the end of my talk, but I hope that I gave you all a good sense of the variety that can come from a career in pediatric ophthalmology. I hope I gave you a sense that we see a wide variety of pathology and do lots of different types of surgeries. That we're able to integrate things like advocacy, diversity, education, research, international work into uh, what is a quite fulfilling career. So thank you all. Thanks so much, Dr. Oates. Couldn't sum it up better than that. Um, really excellent talk. So we're going to move on now to the sort of Q&A portion of the session. Um, for those who are unfamiliar, the way we usually do this is with the sort of raise hand function that Zoom has. Um, so if you'd like to ask a question of Dr. Oates, please um, do that little raise hand button down in the reaction section, um, and then we'll call on you and you can unmute yourself and ask your question. Um, Dr. Oates, while we sort of wait for people, um, we do have some pre-prepared questions that we can run through. One I'll maybe ask you just to start off is um, what you see it's sort of in your personal situation at UCSF and with the things you were balancing, like you mentioned, what do you find to be the challenges of balancing all of that? And what do you find to be most rewarding about having um, so many hats, as you said? <laughs> yeah, I think it's a great question. And I see Fasica joins. I know Fasica wears many, many hats. So she's uh, probably much busier than I am. So <laughs> she empathizes. <laughs> but I would say um, it's, a, it's kind of a blessing and a curse, but more of a blessing. Because I think that um, having the flexibility to kind of have a put in each of these pools leads to kind of cross collaboration and thinking about ways, uh, thinking about things in ways that you might not have. For, so I think the prison project is a perfect example of that, where I never would have expected um, a passion for kind of um, equity and uh, providing eye care to children to over overlap, but because I had um, kind of feet in both of those um, pools, I was able to kind of make that collaborative connection. So um, that's kind of the positive side of it. I would say the downside is like you mentioned, it is just a lot of time, but I think the corollary to that is if it's something that you're kind of passionate about or interested in, um, it often doesn't feel like work if it's something that's kind of um, driven by your passions. Super interesting. Thank you. Um, one other question that we got, we actually had this question submitted a few different times in different forms. Um, the topic of global health, I think, is very interesting to students considering ophthalmology. Um, I was just wondering if you could say a little bit more about global health in the field of pediatric ophthalmology in general. Um, what sorts of things someone might need to be aware of as they're going into that or, or ways that medical students or trainees could start to get involved in that sort of thing, too. Yeah, it's a great question. And, you know, global health is a really big bucket. So I think it's helpful to think about the specific type of global health that you're interested in. When I think about the buckets of global health, I think about kind of service, um, research, and uh, clinical or surgical care, which I guess kind of uh, correlates with um, service. Um, in my specific capacity, the focus is mostly on research. So um, it is working with local stakeholders to ask questions that might be harder to ask in um, a place like America, where things are more expensive, um, where people might be less open to um, kind of participating in research. Um, the other exciting part about that is being able to mentor people on the ground. Um, so I have, there's one pediatric ophthalmologist that serves, I think, like a, a 10,000 kilometer area in Nepal. So I'm able to kind of mentor her directly, both in terms of clinical care. She might, you know, present like challenging clinical scenarios. 
to me, and then also in terms of her research skills. So kind of collaborating with her together, um, and similar to those medical students I showed where I was able to kind of work with them and mentor them on their first first author publications, that's kind of my plan um, for that um, pediatric ophthalmologist in Nepal as well. And then from the more service perspective, I think you have to be kind of thoughtful in terms of the ways in which you think about pursuing like a purely like surgical or clinical practice in another country. From an ethical perspective, if there is, for example, a complication from one of your surgeries, which will happen, right? Surgeries have complications. I think it's important to think about the ways in which that would be handled um, if you weren't there. So thinking about partnering with people on the ground, or maybe even um, conferring skills to people on the ground that might be able to provide kind of a more longer term or sustainable um, solution for that specific community. There are a few organizations um, that focus on international work within ophthalmology. The biggest one is probably Orbis, O-R-B-I-S, and they have kind of pioneered what they call the Flying Eye Hospital, which is basically a mobile eye hospital. And they do perform, um, you know, surgeries in resource limited areas, but their main focus is on transferable skills. So providing um, a knowledge transfer to allow for longer term um, care for populations, underserved populations. So as a medical student, I think Orbis definitely works, um, accepts medical students. And then if you find a faculty member that is doing work internationally, those would probably be the best two ways to start getting a taste as a medical student. Amazing, thank you. Um, Shruti, do you wanna go ahead and unmute yourself and ask your question? Yeah, definitely. Thank you so much, Dr. Oates. So my name is Shruti. I go to the University of Texas Medical Branch, which is just outside of Houston. And we actually don't have a pediatric ophthalmologist at my home institution. So my question for you is, um, can you talk specifically about like some of the communication barriers related to pediatric ophthalmology, like with patients who can't advocate for themselves or managing like parental expectations and treatment outcomes, things like that? Yeah. Um, well, I'll start by saying that you are not the only one that does not have a pediatric ophthalmologist. There's only about a thousand pediatric ophthalmologists across the entire country. There's not a lot of us. Um, so there is a, um, a shortage. So guaranteed job security if you decide to become a pediatric ophthalmologist. <laughs> There's lots of children and not a lot of us. Um, so that's... Um, yeah, so you're not in an uncommon situation. In terms of your specific question about communication challenges with children, I think that it actually presents kind of an interesting challenge because you don't have all of the same tools that you would have when you're seeing an adult, right? So you can't always ask the child, what are you experiencing? What are you seeing? Are you seeing double? Does your eye hurt? So a lot of the times you have to rely on um, kind of context clues. You have to rely on your relationship with the parents and trust in the parents that they're able to, you know, kind of convey to you that they think something is wrong with their child, but even if they can't articulate it to kind of trust that. Um, and kind of going back to what I was saying about treating the family unit. So not just thinking about treating the child themselves, but really, you know, discussing the condition thoroughly with the parents so that they have a good understanding of the specific condition, the goals of treatment, the importance of treatment, because ultimately, if the parents don't understand that, or you don't have buy-in from the parents, your treatment outcomes will not be good, uh, because we, we rely a lot on the relationship with the parents. I hope that answers your question. Yeah, it does. Thank you. Caroline, you want to go ahead? Yes, thank you. Hi, Dr. Oates. My name is Caroline. I'm a third year at Beaumont Medical School out in Michigan. Um, thank you so much for all of your advice. It was cool to see these cases and kind of get a little taste of pizza off, though. Um, I'm someone who's like equally interested in pediatrics and ophthalmology and really hoping to pursue that road. I know you touched on it a little bit, but do you mind um, perhaps giving some tips about how to get more peds exposure within ophthalmology, perhaps once we're in residency, um, if that's something that kind of comes organically or if it's kind of program by program? Yeah, definitely. So there are, um, ACGME is the accreditation body for um, graduate medical education. So they kind of regulate what is expected for different um, specialties in terms of surgical and clinical experience. And there is a mandate to have at least 15 strabismus cases, um, which is quite a small number. The minimum for cataract surgery is 86 to give you a, a comparison. Um, but uh, so there is definitely a requirement that any accredited ophthalmology residency program will have exposure to um, pediatric ophthalmology surgery, at least. Um, 
In terms of the kind of like interest in pediatrics and ophthalmology, I think it's a great pairing. Um, there are lots of kind of pediatric surgical specialties and ophthalmology is often kind of like looked over when people think about those, think about maybe like pediatric gastroenterology or pediatric interventional radiology. So I think it's great that you're considering ophthalmology. It does have the advantage of, you know, working with children and have, being able to have an impact on a patient's life, but also having some of the advantages of ophthalmology, which is, um, you know, kind of lifestyle laws in terms of like not being in the hospital in the middle of the night, most nights and things like that. Um, in terms of specifically seeking out pediatric ophthalmology experience, um, APOS is the American Academy of Pediatric Ophthalmology and Strabismus, and they have an annual meeting. So if you're able to submit maybe a project or even just attend that meeting as a medical student or resident, that would be a great kind of exposure to see clinical cases presented, see what's kind of new in research in pediatric ophthalmology. Um, and then there are some kind of like simulators online. So the AAO, which is the American Academy of Ophthalmology has a strabismus simulator. So you could kind of just like play around just to get a sense of what it looks like to see a patient with eye misalignment. Um, and then I would say mentorship is a big thing. So if you're able to kind of identify someone ideally at your own institution that does pediatric ophthalmology and maybe shadow them in clinic, or, um, if there's not someone in your department, maybe asking a faculty member in your department, if they know of someone in private practice in pediatric ophthalmology that would be willing to have you for a day or two. Thank you. That's helpful. Sydney. Hi, Dr. Oates. It's a pleasure to meet you. I just want to say it's very impressive and very inspiring just seeing you and having you here speak with us today. Um, my question is kind of on that same track of mentorship. What is your approach to this medical students you've mentored? especially for those that might be first gen or have no exposure to ophthalmology prior to medical school or even have, you know, a very minute amount of exposure to ophthalmology before hitting those clinical years. How do you kind of get them from where they come in as, you know, first year medical students to becoming a first author on a publication? Yeah, absolutely. I think it's really important to kind of set expectations at the beginning of the relationship. So I like to talk to um, medical students that approach me about kind of their goals and here, you know, if they are committed to ophthalmology or if they're just thinking about it. Um, and that kind of helps me cater their approach. If it's someone that's committed to ophthalmology, then maybe we go into a kind of like more um, nuanced or like um, kind of super specific research project. If it's someone that is kind of still exploring ophthalmology, maybe we'll look for a project that has more kind of cross-sectional appeal. And then in terms of um, kind of uh, first authorship, like you mentioned, I think it's important to just have those conversations up front. So I will give a medical student, you know, kind of an expectation in terms of how much time would be required for a to be the lead kind of person on a specific project and a deadline for a specific meeting that we're aiming to present to and kind of make sure that there is um, some agreement between what the medical student is looking for and then also what I'm looking for. Um, I've been fortunate. Um, I see actually Natan, one of my excellent uh, UCSF <laughs> mentees on the call. So um, I've been fortunate to work with a lot of really excellent UCSF medical students. Um, but yeah, I think really just having that conversation at the beginning of the mentoring relationship in terms of both what the um, mentor is looking to get out of it, but more importantly, what the mentee is looking to get out of it. So whether it's more of like an exploratory project, or whether it's more of a like, I would really like a first author publication to help improve my competitiveness for an ophthalmology residency application. Those conversations can be a little bit hard to have sometimes because it might feel awkward or it might feel um, kind of forced or constrained, but I think that ultimately having that at the beginning helps um, set expectations and make sure that everyone's on the same page. Thank you so much. That's really helpful. Well, Dr. Wrights, I do have a couple more uh, pre-submitted questions I can throw at you if you're up for it. Sure. Um, one question we got asked um, how you've seen the field of pediatric ophthalmology change since you, you know, started your training um, and where you might anticipate it continuing to change uh, by the time that, you know, us medical students now might be entering that field. Yeah, well, I think the um, COVID-19 pandemic um, 
was terrible for many reasons, but one of the positive things that came out of it was innovation and specifically with pediatric ophthalmology, um, thinking about telemedicine as a way to expand access to children's eye care has been kind of a positive thing that I think has a real future in pediatric ophthalmology. Like I mentioned to you all, there is a shortage of pediatric ophthalmologists. There's not a lot of us. So um, I think there's a, like three or four states in the country that have zero pediatric ophthalmologists. So you can imagine that those children are either just not seeking care or driving hours to seek uh, provider in another state, or maybe seeing someone that doesn't have specific expertise in childhood eye disease. Um, so thinking about ways in which we can leverage technology to expand access to childhood eye care is uh, really important, I think, is a future direction for pediatric ophthalmology. So that's things like, um, you know, apps that can test visual acuity, apps that can monitor strabismus, even using something like that virtual reality um, visual field test that I studied with a medical student, um, using something like that to allow patients to have, you know, diagnostic testing at home, and then maybe a telehealth visit with their uh, pediatric ophthalmologist. So I think, um, again, leveraging technology to expand access to care is a exciting future direction for pediatric ophthalmology. And then in terms of what I've seen um, change, I think that there are a few kind of exciting uh, emerging technologies for pediatric ophthalmology. Another one is actually virtual reality as well, but it's for a different purpose. So it's for a therapeutic purpose, actually, for not, not a diagnostic purpose. So you all might have seen children that have like a patch over their eye, which is one of the most common treatments that we have for amblyopia, which is when one, when one eye doesn't see as well as the other. And there um, is a new technology that is essentially using what's called dicoptic therapy, which is where you present different um, intensity stimuli to each eye. So you basically force the eye that is weaker to work a little bit harder to see um, that has shown uh, promising results in clinical trials. So um, that's another kind of exciting area of advancement in the field. That's really interesting to hear. Thank you so much. Um, one final sort of pre-submitted question that we had um, on the topic of pediatric ophthalmology in particular, um, do you find yourself having a um, different amount or different type of collaboration with physicians or healthcare professionals in other specialties, examples being like regular general pediatricians or optometrists, um, given that the care of pediatric patients can be so complicated. Um, can you talk about sort of those connections that you have with other specialties and what that, what role that plays in your day to day? Yeah, that's one of the nice things about pediatric ophthalmology is that there are flavors of both specialist and generalist. So specialists in that you have kind of subspecialty expertise that is limited, <laughs> like we've talked about, because there's not a lot of us, um, but generalist in that oftentimes you are the primary eye provider for a patient. So for example, you have a patient with a um, retinal detachment, a child with a retinal detachment. You will send them to a retina doctor to have their retina repaired, but after the retina surgery, you'll continue seeing them because you'll be the one that's prescribing them glasses checking their eye pressure, making sure that they're not developing a cataract, things like that. Um, so that's actually one really nice part of my specialty is that there are um, kind of broad strokes and small strokes at the same time. So you get a taste of both um, being more of like a primary care provider, but also having um, subspecialty expertise that a lot of other providers really rely on. Looks like we have one more question um, from Shweta. Do you want to go ahead and unmute and ask? Yes, thanks so much for um, speaking with us, Dr. Oates. I'm Shweta, I'm an M3 at Hopkins, and was just wondering um, if you think global ophthalmology lends itself well to pediatrics because kids kind of learn and unlearn things better because they're more plastic, or um, is it not as beneficial because they required more longitudinal follow-up compared to um, an adult like octo population that is like troubled by some sort of pathology? Yeah, it's a really good and complicated question because I think both of the points that you present are true. <laughs> so I think that if you think about just kind of technical, um, like for example, like doing strabismus surgery abroad, that actually is probably lower risk than you know something like cataract or glaucoma surgery because you're doing surgery on the outside of the eye. The risks of vision threatening complications from strabismus surgery are much lower than they are from intraocular surgery. So from that perspective, pediatric ophthalmology is super conducive to a global health lens. On the opposite side of things, um, a lot of pediatric ophthalmology is not the surgery itself, but actually the management of things like patching and glasses after surgery. So if you don't have someone on the ground that has expertise in managing those things, 
the outcomes of your surgery are not going to be great because the surgery is about not only the surgery itself, but also the post-operative care. So I think it's an opportunity to mentor um, ophthalmologists abroad, even if they're not specifically pediatric ophthalmologists, to at least um, create some foundational knowledge in the basics of pediatric ophthalmology um, to create a sustainable kind of global health program from that perspective. Awesome. Thank you. Josephine. Hi, thank you, Dr. Oates, for your awesome talk. I'm Josephine. I'm an M1 at Medical College of Georgia in Augusta. Kind of going off of the last question, could you um, give a bit of background about how you got involved in the clinic in Nepal? I think you mentioned you had a mentor there as well. Yeah, definitely. So I am early in my career. I'm in my fifth year on faculty and I applied for what's called a career development award, which is um, a grant from the NIH. And essentially to get that grant, you have to put together a mentorship team and a research project. And so I was fortunate at UCSF that we have something called the Proctor Foundation, which actually is not pediatric ophthalmology focused. It's um, generally kind of cornea and uveitis focused. But because of my interest in global health, I kind of started there because they have a lot of connections internationally. So my specific mentor has projects in Nepal, Ethiopia, uh, Niger, Thailand, Vietnam. So I was able to kind of leverage the existing infrastructure that he had created for this larger project and propose expanding it um, for my specific career development award. I would say generally um, global health um, research or any type of research is, um, benefited a lot when you're a young faculty member by working with a mentor who has kind of a more robust and established both funding mechanism and research program so that you're able to kind of gain the skills that you need um, to eventually create your own independent research program or your own independent global health program. Thank you. That was very insightful. All right, well, I think uh, for the sake of everyone's time, we'll start sort of winding up there. Um, thank you everybody who sent us questions ahead of time or unmuted yourself and asked them tonight, really great questions. And of course, thank you Dr. Oates for your wonderful talk and for giving us such great answers and an amazing discussion. Um, I'm just gonna pass it back over to Maya for some last reminders. <laughs>